Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 20th official 7 Investing podcast. Here at 7 Investing, our mission is to empower you to invest in your future. And we do that by providing our seven best stock market opportunities every month, but also educational programs such as this podcast. I'm 7 Investing founder Simon Erickson, joined today by my colleagues, 7 Investing advisors, Matt Cochran, Austin Lieberman, and Steve Simington. Gentlemen, I hope you're ready because we're going to kickstart our 20th show. Are you ready for us to kick in? Let's do this. Let's rumble. The, uh, the, the topic, I think, for the show today is how the market is being considered by many to be overvalued. The terms bubble are starting to circulate in conversations where bears are quick to point out that valuation multiples are stretched beyond historical averages, and many believe that the recovery since March was just too soon and that expectations in the market are simply too high. But here at 7 Investing, we sent an email out last week uh, with the perspectives that we all shared about companies that we personally sold far too soon. And these were painful and excruciating memories from all of us of money that we left on the table from selling some of our favorite companies too soon and leaving money on the table. Let's continue that dialogue in today's podcast because I'd like to put some more context into this whole overvalued conversation. Let's start the first segment of our show by focusing on companies that were previously considered to be too expensive or too overvalued, but still went on to provide incredible returns for the investors that held on to them over the long term. And so I'm going to ask for every advisor to present one company that, that they've looked at that fit this scenario. And one caveat for this, it cannot be a tech company, gentlemen, because people are always calling tech out overvalued all the time. Uh, Austin Lieberman, let's start with you. And if you can see our video, it looks like Austin, you're in the, the beach somewhere. So I'm going to ask you to take five minutes away from the beautiful skyline and the beach background to tell me about a company that looked like it was overvalued. You know, I'm giving up this beach vacation for this podcast, so I'm very dedicated. Uh, yes, the definitely echo exactly what you covered. There's a lot of talk about the market in general being overvalued. And while I'm sure there's companies today that are definitely overvalued, there's, there's companies that are always overvalued. Uh, I don't know if the entire market is overvalued or not. And you know, I don't think we care too much at Seven Investing if the entire market is overvalued because we focus on finding the best individual stocks. And so I love what we're talking about today. Uh, the company that I'm going to talk about that has outperformed for more than a decade has been called expensive, has baffled people's imaginations because it's just a, a food company. Uh, I actually turned to our amazing hundreds of millions of fans on Twitter and I asked for some of the most boring stocks that have been, uh, I think, uh, returned 10 times in value. And we got a lot of great ideas. One of the most popular ones was this company and it's uh, Domino's Pizza. So we had Ships of Fool, uh, David Jacobs, Dan and R.I., and multiple other people share dominoes. So thank you. I mean, everybody that got involved in that thread, thank you. We love interacting with you all. And, and you helped me uh, pick the company for this podcast. So let's talk about dominoes. Um, dominoes over the last 10 years has returned 2,830%, which is uh, a massive outperformer compared to the S&P 500. And it's actually outperformed uh, several of the, the FANG stocks, which are, are tech stocks and are, you know, what everybody's familiar with as, as the top performing stocks. And Domino's is really just kind of a, a boring old food company. And the story behind Domino's is that they struggled for a long time. A, they brought in new management. I think it was a new CEO. He basically called out the company for having a, a terrible recipe and, and they basically reinvigorated the business. They turned to become, they're not a tech company, but they, they turned uh, to become a much more digitally and delivery oriented company. They uh, came up with a new recipe for uh, their sauce and, and basically just 
uh, restarted their entire menu and their entire presence. And since then, they've completely turned the company around. And like I said, over the past 10 years, the stock is up 2,830%. Over the last five years, uh, they're still outperforming. Stock is up almost 250%. Um, three years, it's up 112%. So this is a serial outperformer. Um, the reason that it, you know, it's considered or, or it has been considered overvalued is again because it's kind of just a boring uh, pizza delivery company. Um, it has sported a PE ratio at a high. It was at 46, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about um, uh, fast food or, or different food companies. And it's currently, uh, it's had an average P, uh, price to earnings ratio of 29.66. And it's currently sitting at about 36. So a little bit higher than average. Um, but the interesting thing is even if somebody would have bought back when the Domino's PE ratio was at its very highest of 46, that was in 2017. And so even since then, the stock is up uh, 112%. So as an investor, you could have bought it at its very high uh, of PE ratio, which was absurd. And still, if you held on to it for three years, you're sitting at 112% return while the PE ratio has actually contracted, which taking this back to the discussion today and th that you opened with Simon, you know, we might see that in some of the, the stocks that we're invested in today. And especially me and the, the style of stocks that I invest in, which are, you know, high growth tech companies and software as a service companies. Um, they, we might see price to sales ratios contract, but what I want to emphasize is if the company is managed well, continues to innovate and continues to grow, that's okay. And, and they can still be winners over the next three, five and 10 years. And Domino's is a great example of that. And was this a successful turnaround, Austin? I mean, you said that they brought in a new CEO, they kind of changed the recipe. Were, was the market not giving enough credit to the fact that Domino's was able to turn around and correct its past mistakes? Yeah, I think, you know, and, and I wasn't heavily following Domino's uh, back through this. So this is just kind of the research that I've done. But but I think there was a lot of, from, from the research I did, there was a lot of kind of disbelief. And uh, it was looked at as a, as a turnaround that people didn't believe in until it was multiple years in. And then a lot of the articles were talking about how Domino's had run too far, too fast and was up too much. And that was three or five years ago and the stock has continued to outperform. So yeah, exactly what you said, Simon. Um, it, it was a successful turnaround, but, it, but at first and for multiple years, people really didn't believe in it. And then they just kind of kept doing their thing and, and outperforming. Their, their marketing campaign was incredible. It was very bold. I, I don't know if you guys remember, but like they basically were just running ads nationwide saying about how bad their pizza sucked for so long. And they would like show real reviews their pizza had gotten, uh, like you know one star on Yelp or you know wherever else people were leaving reviews, and they revamped their recipe and then they would show them like delivering pizza to these people who had left bad reviews saying give us another chance and basically just kind of end it like saying hey America give us a second chance, and then beyond that like after revamping their pizza recipe they just invested heavily in technology, uh, like they have the anywhere. Uh, like program now where you can order pizza by like, if you're signed up for it, you can, you can tweet out any emoji of a pizza and that'll to Domino's and they'll just from that, they'll deliver your, uh, your, your saved order in your Domino's account. Uh, they have a, a zero click app. Like, so we used to use this when my wife was on her way home from work. She would, all you had to do when you're sitting in traffic, she knew the exact moment on her commute to hit this app. So you're sitting in traffic, you can't really like fool around and order a pizza, but you have a saved preferred order and you would just click it and it would start a 10 second timer. And when that 10 second timer went off, your preferred saved order at your saved location of Domino's would automatically get ordered. And she knew the exact second to hit it in her commute so that it'd be ready when she passed by the Domino's on her way home and we'd have pizza that night. That's a and great story. And it's interesting that like when I think about even now, you know, pizza companies, the, the ones that come to mind are Domino's. And for me, it's like Hungry Howie's, which I don't know if that's even a nationwide chain, but it's definitely not high quality. But I just think about the commercials. The one that doesn't come to mind is uh, P 
Pizza Hut and then, you know, Papa John's comes to mind a little bit, but for negative reasons, because they've had a lot of negative news headlines, but, but yeah, their, their marketing has just been awesome. And I think it's still pretty good today. Here talking about Domino's and, and Hungry Howie's has gotten me a little hungry. Uh, do you have a company that also makes a product that might tie in well with pizza? No, oh, beer. So you shared a, a, uh, a link earlier to, I think it was, it was like the American customer satisfaction index that said the, the, among the most loved industries, uh, and the highest customer satisfaction score on the list was breweries. And, uh, one of the stocks that I've covered and loved for a long time is Boston beer company. It's ticker S a M, uh, that's Sam for its flagship Samuel Adams, beers, uh, but it also owns Twisted Tea, Angry Orchard. Uh, more recently, it's Truly Hard Seltzer brand. Uh, they acquired, I think, Dogfish Head Brewery a little over a year ago for like 300 million. But um, I actually recently stumbled upon an old profile in a stock picking system I used to use where I picked Boston beer uh, a little over 10 years ago. This was in February 2010 at a starting price of about 46 bucks a share. And uh, after a nice little earnings pop last week, uh, right now we're sitting at about $818 per share today. That's a 1,700% gain over the last decade. And uh, kind of incredible for a, you know, a, a brewery, a beer company. Um, but I remember thinking, even in the beginning, that Boston beer always felt expensive. And I always hesitated to buy it back then, uh, you know, I pick it as an outperform, but it's like, well, maybe I can get a better entry point. Maybe I can, maybe I can. And uh, it was always expensive, especially relative to its larger peers like AB InBev and, you know, Molson Coors now. And actually it just passed Molson Coors in terms of market capitalization. I think it's a $9.5 billion company. Molson Coors was somewhere in the eight billions. Uh, AB InBev is what, 95 or something. It's absurdly large, but um, it always felt expensive, you know, no matter what traditional valuation metric you looked at. And uh, even looking back, you know, over the past year and a half or so, you know, we see it with a trailing PE at like 42, uh, you know, six months ago or a couple months ago, it was trading at like 60 times trailing earnings and, uh, you know, 50 times forward estimates and, and, you know, five times sales, which seems, you know, kind of crazy for a, a beer company. But, it was one of those uh, interesting names that was basically working to grab slices of enormous industries and working from very small bases. And that was exactly the kind of company that I love. And uh, <clears throat> again, you know, just felt expensive all the time. And one thing to note is a huge chunk of those gains have come this year. It was sort of like the sneaky, uh, I think someone mentioned on Twitter, it's like the sneaky, you know, COVID play where everybody's going out and, you know, they're not, they're not, not drinking beer they're continuing to buy alcohol uh, but actually uh, the other funny thing is that uh, their exceptional quarter um, their their most recent quarterly results that smashed wall street's expectations revenue was up 42 percent year of year earnings almost doubled and um, or they more than doubled and nobody expected that but uh, that came in spite of weakness from their uh, flagship Samuel Adams brand. So they're not even firing on all cylinders, but they really credited uh, the relative outperformance of Truly Spiked and Sparkling, that hard seltzer brand. They said it was the only hard seltzer introduced, uh, not introduced this year that actually gained market share. And uh, I dug into the seltzer segment after that call a little bit and found, you know, it's really a fantastic place to be outperforming for them. So uh, that flexibility for them to be able to branch outside their core competencies has really helped them. Um, part of the reason seltzer is interesting is because it caters to college educated millennials uh, who tend to spend almost twice as much on off premise alcohol than their kind of traditional beer drinking counterparts. Um, so it, it's kind of uh, incredible to watch this uh, this growth story unfold outside of their core markets. Um, That's a really good one, Steve. I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where I've, I've heard the term, they're just another brewery or they're just another beer. You know, they're kind of lumping them in with the bigger players that you just mentioned. But even though Boston Beer is doing fantastic lately, Anheuser-Busch has just gotten completely slammed in this, mm -hmm. in this COVID pandemic recently. Stock has definitely gotten crushed. Uh, what, what's your perspective on distribution? You know, that's a topic that keeps coming up of, 
of uh, the distribution to, you know, the, to the bars and the restaurants and all the different locations. It seems like that's worked against the larger brewers, but maybe to the advantage of Boston beer. How do you think about distribution? Yeah, they, they talked about uh, like struggles because, you know, your restaurants and everything really, you know, that they kind of got crushed, but I think uh, that's why the, the truly seltzer uh, brands have helped them outperform. And that was one of those, you know, like I mentioned earlier, off-premise alcohol is uh, is what they've really focused on. And this hard seltzer category is one of those that, you know, where people are spending a lot more money. Um, and you think of, you know, Boston beer as truly, uh, there's also, you know, there's a bunch of others out there, White Claw. Uh, and those are sort of what is, what are the big hits for younger drinkers with money to spend. And, uh, and that's kind of where, you know, Boston beer has basically kind of flexed their flexibility uh, in a sense that uh, that as a, a slightly smaller business, they they can actually do. Whereas you know someone like AB InBev can say they're they're working to adapt to drinkers' habits, but it's harder to to steer a ship of that size uh, in the same way. Well, I'm going to play the uh, the role of the value investing villain on today's show. Hmm. So <laughs> it's important to note that yes, uh, there are plenty of examples of companies that succeed. Uh, providing investors with like life-changing returns from high valuations. But also, statistically speaking, stocks with high valuations perform worse than stocks with low valuations. So I'm going to give an example of an inar inarguably great company that realized a lofty valu valuation, and the company still went on to do great, but it saw a stock price struggle for more than a decade before getting going again. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our listeners to the Nifty 50 stocks. So in the 1960s, this was a group of 50 stocks that allegedly represented America's greatness and dominance in the free world. And, uh, you know, you were told if you, if you just bought these stocks, you could forget about any other making any other investing decision and you would be just fine. Uh, you know, and this was in the 60s through the early 70s. And this included companies like Coca-Cola, Disney, IBM, Philip Morris, McDonald's, Procter & Gamble, the list goes on. And uh, though today we look at some of these as has-beens, uh, they were just coming into their heyday in the early 70s. You know, so these were the FANG stocks, the Silicon Valley tech darlings of their day. And uh, just buy these, hold them forever, and you were going to be just fine. And specifically, uh, we're going to look at McDonald's. So why? Well, because McDonald's franchises most of its restaurants, it's actually an asset light, fairly high margin business. And uh, before I get going, just real quick, uh, what inspired a lot of this was Vitaly Katzenelson's blog, thecontrarianedge.com, and uh, Wandry's Business Wars did a great podcast series on McDonald's versus Burger King, and the movie The Founder. And the, all three of those resources really explore McDonald's early years. So the McDonald's brothers were geniuses as far as setting up the restaurant space for optimal speed and food prep. And they were really the, the pioneers in that space. And then Ray Kroc came in and, and bought, bought it from them. And even though that, he was a genius at franchising. And even though that relationship uh, ended very badly. It worked out phenomenally well for the restaurant and shareholders. Uh, so in the 50s, it was a very, very simple menu. And the fish filet was introduced in 1963. And that was their first new menu item in nine years. And then in 1968, the Big Mac was introduced. So in the early 70s, we're still talking about a very young company. It was growing its store count within the US like gangbusters. And uh, you know that's not even counting the huge international opportunity that it would capitalize on in the coming years and decades. So in 1973, McDonald's revenue was $580 million, which is more than 10X. They had 10X to revenue in the past seven years. And you go forward a decade and the revenue was $3.3 billion. So in the next decade, they were, they were still gonna 6X their revenue. So if you were, in 19, if you were an investor in 1973, listening to the, an investor pitch for McDonald's, you know, you could talk about how fast and great the revenue growth had been at the fast food restaurant and the projections for that going forward and how great it would do. And uh, guess what? The pitch was right. The, the company was still gonna grow revenue. Uh, it was gonna grow at six, it was gonna six X its revenue in the next decade. But in that decade from 1973 to 1984, so 11 years, the stock price's annual returns were just 1.75%. And that's not because the restaurant didn't execute. It's not because McDonald's management made strategic mistakes. It's just because its valuation was too high. And uh, in 1972, uh, just basically too much growth was already priced into the stock. Its PE ratio was over 80. Uh, now, great companies do come back. So McDonald's returns were lackluster for that decade. 
But if you're a shareholder for two decades, you saw annual returns clearing 12%, which that's, that's not bad at all. So it did eventually grow into its valuation and exceed it. But just remember, you know, if you're a buy and hold forever kind of investor, take a good look, hard look at yourself in the mirror because purchase prices do matter. And while great companies will grow into even lofty valuations, it can be a long slog before you start seeing decent returns if your purchase price was too high. That's a great lesson about McDonald's, Matt. And it seems like the bottom line for that is the expectations are just a little too high. The company did everything right, but still too much was baked into the stock price. And it turned into what was it? One, 2% for uh, returns annually for a decade. Yeah. 1.75% for a decade. So and is that including dividends, Matt? Uh, I don't know. Honestly, to be honest, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even think it paid a Did it pay a dividend back then? I don't even know. I, I don't know. But don't even know. if they, even if it isn't including dividends, what does that add? Two or 3% a year, you know, sure. maybe. So still not, not great, but yeah, that's interesting. You just, you just made me want to sell all my stocks. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> what a great franchise model though. What a great story. Remembering how well they did that. Ray Kroc, like you mentioned. Um, Steve, any, any comments on McDonald's? Uh, not specifically. I, it, it makes me want to find, I guess, um, sort of the next McDonald's, you know, I feel like there's, there's other franchises that are promising, uh, and it's one of those crowded spaces, but, uh, it, it makes me want to dig back into the restaurant space and, you know, consider concepts that work well. You know, your Chipotle's out there uh, that still have room to grow. I was just going to say that might, I mean, the next McDonald's might have just happened with Chipotle, you know? Yeah, well, which know. was incidentally a spinoff of, you know, it was, That's true. I think they were owned by McDonald's. Yeah, they were. Spun off they into were. their own company. So, uh, um, yeah, there's, you know, there's been, there's been some that have kind of, kind of proven to be a bust, but, um, I don't, but, but it's yeah, it's going to be hard to like to match that market that McDonald's was going into because it was just a bunch of one-offs, you know, yeah. that McDonald's was competing against, and Burger King did come up. You know, Burger King was on the East Coast, True. Um, and McDonald's the first franchise was in California, and uh, you know, but there's just so much space those two companies could grow into for so long. Uh, it, it's hard to the restaurant space is definitely not like that now. It's a different world I'm, for them. But, I'm really uh, interested yeah. to, to see how we just got back from a, a the worst RV vacation ever. Uh, no, it was great. I love <laughs> my family, but I don't love RVs for vacations. Um, anyways, back on topic, we went to a couple different places, we went to Starbucks and a couple different fast food places along the way. And, you know, most of them have their kitchens closed or nobody's dining inside and you either have to order through a mobile app and they've got the entire store sectioned off in about a five foot area where you can stand inside the door and wait for your, your food. This, this happened at Starbucks or you go through drive through And I'm really interested to see over the next five years, decade, whatever, uh, even in the next year, how the new, call it fast casual or fast food restaurants that are built how they change physically. Are they going to be smaller storefronts with just a focus on takeout, um, what Uber, Uber Eats or whatever the delivery apps are and then drive-throughs? And so are we going to see a smaller footprint with less eating out or are they going to continue to, to build restaurants the same size? It's just, there's going to be a fascinating, fascinating time. And I, I think the winners are going to be the companies, you know, unfortunately, I think like smaller mom and pop restaurants that don't have the ability to go digital and do all this delivery and stuff are the ones that are going to get hit the hardest. And then the big chains that can adapt and go digital and do all these delivery things and have the cash flow are going to be the ones that, that succeed. So we might see kind of small businesses, at least in the restaurant space, get hurt. Yeah. Well, and not to mention the franchise versus the company owned model, right? I mean, we mentioned, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Domino's had that same franchise model that McDonald's did. Compare that to something like Chipotle or Chick-fil-A, which is almost all company owned locations. So they have a lot more control, especially over those levers, like you just mentioned, Austin, about the efficiency and getting people through there, the digital orders, um, kind of a trade-off. You go, you go either way for those. I will, um, 
I'll throw in one last company too for consideration too. I'm going to take this in a little different direction than you guys. You know, we've talked about pizza and we talked about beer and we talked about junk food. I'm going to talk about yoga. So I'm going to talk about Lululemon, which I, I really think has just done a fantastic job at building a consumer brand that is loved. And that's just a competitive advantage for them for the past decade, at least. Uh, for those that, that have never heard of Lululemon, I'd be surprised if too many people haven't heard of this company by this point. One of the largest yoga outfitters out there. They really made a name for themselves with uh, black yoga pants that they were selling 10 years ago for $70, today for $98. But it's just, this is something that people would see others wearing. And so everyone wanted to wear those same Lululemon pants when they were in yoga classes. And there was kind of, you know, this, this social influence of people wanting to buy them. And Lululemon went all in on this category. It knew that it wanted to be associated with yoga. It wasn't selling the fabric. It was selling the lifestyle. And that really insulated it from competitors that later joined this space. You know, we saw Under Armour try, Under Armour try to do this with yoga. We saw Gap with Atleta try to do this with, with yoga. Uh, it didn't matter because Lululemon was, was all in, you know, at it, its locations, its, um, its associates of its stores were instructors that were also teaching classes within the locations themselves. It was very focused, very, very high customer satisfaction. And that indeed manifested in, in very high prices. And so it's incredible that this company uh, for the last decade has traded with a PE ratio, uh, a price to earnings ratio of between 40 and 60 for a decade. And this is the market basically saying, we're going to give you this premium valuation above other clothing retailers out there because you've been able to show us you can maintain those premium price points because they've got um, the overall customer satisfaction. They've got the lifestyle and they ring true with consumers. And that's truly what this consumer brand competitive advantage really means to me. You know, this is a perfect example of it right here. And so the stock basically kept its valuation multiple, increased right alongside with its earnings per share. Uh, earnings per share over the last decade increased sixfold, and the stock is a 15 bagger over that same time frame. So it's been incredible to see what Lululemon, a humble retailer of, of clothing uh, that expanded, you know, went into men's category. It kind of sold other things like water bottles and headbands and things like this too, but really got its root with, with this yoga movement that it, it fostered and it put a lot of work behind. Even with the pandemic where people are not shopping in those bricks and mortar locations during these past couple of months, it counteracted that with a 68% year over year increase in its e-commerce segment. And so the brand is very strong. People are still buying the clothes. They're doing it online now and they can't buy them in the stores. And to me, Lululemon is just a company that's knocked it out of the park with, with consumer satisfaction. They've always called it overvalued because it's always been uh, at a market premium to its competitors, but it's been worth it because it's really been quite a ride for the past decade. Is Lululemon, is it officially, I mean, it's not a fad anymore, right? I mean, it's just fashion now, right? Is it like Nike? At some point, it wasn't like a fad where people are dressing in athletic gear. It was just what people wore. And we're kind of at that spot with Lululemon, right? Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, people were saying fad for years, right? They were saying the same thing about Whole Foods and healthy eating and lifestyle brands and, you know, athletic. I mean, it's kind of something that's maintained rather than just fizzled away. Yeah, I, I've got an almost 13-year-old daughter who loves her, like, Lululemon, you know, stuff. But... Uh, and Steve, you wear some too, Lulus like too that. around the house, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Simon, Maybe they've so. had their their fair share of uh, controversy. <laughs> I and was going to say founder CEO issues notwithstanding. Changes. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and still overcame them all, you know? Yeah. There were, yeah. There were a few few times where you kind of cringe at, at some of the, the, the flubs, executive uh, flubs they had along the way. But man, that brand has proven resilient. Their founder put his foot in his mouth a couple of times. Austin said some things that, you know, were definitely not uh, taken well by, by their consumers. And, you know, like you said, there was kind of a revolving door of CEOs there for a little while there. But did that, did any of that really matter to the brand that people were, were associating themselves with? I, I don't think so. And that's why it continued. And so, you know, this is kind of wrapping everything up together. Give us, share your thoughts with us. Uh, we're at 7investing on, on Twitter. Uh, leave us a review for our, our podcast here. If you're listening to it um, uh, through any of your, your, your 
uh, podcast distribution stations that you listen to. We'd love to hear what you think. Info at seveninvesting.com. What are companies that you think uh, did a fantastic job, even when they were expensive and overvalued? We'd love to hear your stories, especially if they're personal stories that you held on or even sold like we did selling several of our favorite companies too. And so that's a great look at the past. Let's transition to the future now. Let's take this a step further and say, okay, what is a company that's on your investing radar today that is similarly being called overvalued, but you still think it could be an opportunity going forward? There is no shortage of companies being called overvalued right now. In fact, I think that some people think every company in the market is overvalued right now, but let's pick out four of them that, that stand out. Uh, Steve, let's start with you on this one. And by the way, no restrictions. You can pick a tech company. You can pick any industry you want to for this one. What's an overvalued company that's got opportunity? Well, then I'm going to pick a tech company and uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with 2U. And that's literally the number two, the letter U, ticker T-W-O-U. Uh, they're an online education platform company. And uh, I, um, I've followed 2U for a long time. And I actually had the pleasure of interviewing their co-founder and CEO, Chip uh, Pausick. Shortly after their IPO in 2014, 2U also uh, acquired uh, Get Smarter. They're a short course, uh, non-degree uh, specialist, and they acquired Trilogy Education uh, along the way. They specialize in tech boot camps. So to kind of expand their reach, um, and you know, 2U actually had, they had some tumult a couple of years ago um, when they sort of reset their growth plans. It seemed like some of their, well, some of their smaller uh, university partners, they have 75, 73, 75 university partners last I checked. Uh, but some of their larger uh, partner universities appeared to be kind of scaling back admissions and the class sizes were smaller uh, than they were initially. So they sort of reset their growth plans uh, a couple of years ago, uh, but they've really rebounded nicely. And uh, they seem to have kind of momentum on their side. And um, you know, if you didn't already think that the world would eventually shift to more effective solutions for online learning over time, uh, I think the pandemic should only cement the notion that online education is here to stay. And uh, to you as a first mover and an obvious you know, industry leader in that business, uh, I think has plenty of room to grow from here. I think uh, one of their more recent investor presentations pointed out that the global market for higher education is worth about 2.5 trillion. And the online portion of that is just a tiny sliver right now. Still, I believe to use, you know, they've got a market cap of about 2.6 billion um, revenue this year is supposed to be just over 700 million. I think 830 million is what consensus estimates next year calls for. Um, but really, I think they've scratched, they just scratched the surface of their longer term growth story. They could be really interesting to watch uh, over the next few years, but uh, they've rallied pretty hard from their March lows. And uh, there's going to be no shortage of people, you know, calling them very expensive. Um, they're not, you know, profitable. You won't find uh, forward or trailing PE ratios. You know, they're trading about four times sales right now, I think. Um, so, you know, they're going to look expensive. Um, one of the things about the company I know with their, their core business is that they, um, they incur much of the startup cost for the programs that they launch with their university partners in exchange for the lion's share of the tuition revenue down the road. So it's something that as they scale, you know, should eventually kind of gain steam. But uh, uh, I think it should be really, really fun to watch the company um, grow uh, over the next several years, kind of see where they go from here. Um, but I suspect, you know, 10 years from now, they're going to be a whole lot bigger than a 2.6, $2.7 billion business. So. Good one, Steve. Yep. To you. And what a tailwind right now. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with education as a whole during these next couple of months. Um, Austin Lieberman, how about you? What's, what's the company that's on your radar right now that's overvalued? I am going to a company that I own, which is something I like to do uh, when we talk about things in public, but also for our seven investing recommendations, just because I believe in, in skin in the game, right? And so this is a small little fitness company called Peloton Interactive. They're centered around empowering people to improve their lives through fitness. Uh, their core products, which again, most people are familiar with are a stationary bike, a treadmill, 
in a digital app that allows users to stream workout classes through a subscription service. Uh, so none of that is, is a new invention, right? Treadmills have been around for millions of years. Uh, just kidding, probably not millions of years, but for a long time. Stationary bikes have been around for a long time. There's tons of different brands and workout subscriptions have been around for a really long time. And so since Peloton came public, there's been, even before, there's been doubt around their business model and their competitive advantage. And what I, the reason I own shares is because the results have been outstanding even before COVID, which I'll get into those results in a minute. But, but um, when I think about Peloton, I, I think about the, Simon, you talked about Lulu Lamon and a clothing company that is seen as a premium brand and has had a premium valuation for more than a decade. Peloton fits you know, a very similar mold with probably a pretty similar customer base as well. So I think it could have a future, you know, very similar to, to that of uh, Lulu. And what I think they're doing that people are undervaluing and, and that the market is still misunderstanding, which is why I think this is a great opportunity, is they're building community behind it. And so it's it's really the first fitness or connected fitness brand that I think has, has solved that issue of making this a community-based experience. And so I see people out on Twitter all the time talking about doing rides with their friends and, and there's leaderboards and all kinds of competitions. And you can hold your friends accountable and see different scoreboards and all kinds of things. And so all of that kind of gamifies it. And that's going to give the brand staying power. And then, you know, their model, basically you can, I think you can either pay outright or you can basically just finance your bike or treadmill over time. And it ends up being around a hundred dollars a month. And, and for that, you're paying off your, your bike, but you're also paying for your fitness subscription, which gives you all of the live classes and stuff. And once people get that and, and, and they pay off their bike, their bill is going to go down a little bit and they're going to be paying less, but still getting access to all the fitness classes. So I think it's a very sticky model. The other thing, you know, I think a, a growth catalyst moving forward um, and the company I was at before I was let go uh, due to coronavirus, we actually had a fitness stipend and employees at the company could charge a hundred bucks a month towards their fitness. And a lot of employees ordered Peloton bikes and paid paid for it with their fitness stipend. And so when we think about the way that work has changed, and I believe work has changed forever um, to where we're always going to have some type of hybrid model because this isn't the first coronavirus. It's not the first pandemic. It's not going to be the last. And then, you know, other things are going to happen and businesses aren't going to be able to say, oh, this caught us off guard. We didn't have a plan to go remote or hybrid. So I think this is, we're in the future right now. I can, I expect, and I only see more businesses trying to take care of their employees as they need less office space and more people working from home. It's actually a lot cheaper to pay a hundred bucks a month for an employee to, to have a fitness stipend and take care of themselves and stay mentally well and physically well than to have, you know, these massive offices in tech centers like Silicon Valley and Manhattan and New York city that they used to have. So I think that's a catalyst as well. And then real quick, just, just jumping into the numbers, um, third quarter highlights for the company, which, and, and this is fascinating. I'm going to get to this, connect this in a minute, but these came out on May 6th. So remember that date, May 6th. Connecting, connected fitness subscribers grew 94% to over 886,100. Uh, and paid digital subscribers grew 64% to over 176,000. So um, 886,000 connected fitness subscribers, you know, those aren't all paid. Their actual paid digital subscribers grew 64% to 176,000. Um, and their total members grew to over 2.6 million. Total revenue grew 66% to 524.6 million. Their workouts were up, uh, and this was after a couple of weeks of, of COVID, obviously. 
uh, in this quarter. Their workouts were up, their engagement was up. People were averaging 17.7 monthly workouts uh, per connected fitness subscriber uh, versus 13.9 in the same period the previous year. So that, that was up nicely. Their guidance, and so this is where this date is important, this May 6th date. They're, they guided for the full year of 2020 to 1.04 to 1.05 million connected fitness subscribers, which was 104% growth. And they guided for revenue growth, uh, total revenue growth, or total revenue to be 1.72 billion, uh, which was a 89% growth at the midpoint. Well, then on May 12th, I think it was, so this is six days after they reported those earnings, and remember, the number we're paying attention to is their guidance for 1.04 million connected fitness subscribers. Six days later, they announced that they crossed the 1 million connected fitness subscriber mark, and so they're... Uh, about 70% of the way to the high end of their guide and they're less than halfway through the, uh, their current quarter. And so what that means is that the trend that, you know, started early and, and was only a, a small part of that quarter that they just reported their third quarter actually intensified and surpassed the company's own projections and own estimations. Um, now that they're kind of, caught up and they did a live update on May 12th and they're far surpassing their, their uh, estimations for connected fitness subscribers, which is basically then, you know, all of the rest of the numbers kind of build off of that. And so, you know, the momentum is strong. It's a strong business model. I think people, it's expensive. I think, uh, but I think people are underestimating it and uh, it's currently sitting at a, uh, a forward price to sales ratio of 4.9 growing revenue at 65%. Good, good company with Peloton there though. Uh, like you mentioned, it's a connected fitness opportunity that many people are just thinking it's a, it's a bike company. Uh, I'd be curious I think it's to actually see one of this- Matt's oh. favorite companies. Matt, do you have any thoughts about Peloton and it, it being a value play? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, the, I mean, I guess I just wonder what its total adjustable market is. Like, I, like, I, right? It, it's it's definitely a premium product, which I, I know can do well. It's still, the, the as a consumer, the price tag on it seems a, a little daunting to ask if you ask me. But maybe not. I, I don't know. That's the whole point, Matt. We're calling you might these say overvalued it's opportunities. Overvalued. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, Matt, yeah. how about you, Matt? What is your overvalued company right now that you're looking at? Uh, so I'm gonna say Microsoft. And so not only, you know, you can look at the PE ratio, PE, PE ratio is 35, but the, the market cap on it is $1.5 trillion. So there's a, a lot of people who would just say like, just because of its size alone, it, it can't grow too, too much more. But just going, you know, I just reported earnings uh, this week and, or last week and just going real quick. I mean, like it's still, it's in so many areas that are growing. Like I, th- I think this company has, has a lot more room to go. Uh, so Office 365 commercial revenue growth this last quarter was 19%. You know, Office 365 consumer subscribers are now almost 43 million. Uh, LinkedIn revenue increased 10%. Uh, Microsoft Dynamics, which is like their commerce and CRM uh, software, Dynamics 365, the revenue growth 38%. Uh, the server products and cloud services revenue, that, was, uh, that rose 19% which was driven by Azure, which is as big as it is, Azure grew by 47% this quarter. And they said it was, it was actually hurt. You know, th- these numbers were actually hurt by, by, by COVID. Uh, Windows, Windows OEM revenue, it was up 7%. You know, that, that's a boring uh, business, but it's super high margin and it, it, it's growing by 7%. A- Xbox uh, content and services, uh, that was up 65%. I mean, gaming is just knocking it out of the park. Uh, and I know I don't have the Minecraft numbers in front of me, but I know Minecraft engagement was up too. That, you know, that's a franchise they bought years ago and hardly anyone talks about it anymore, but it's a, still a huge, huge gaming franchise. Uh, surface revenue was up 28%. So all I would say is uh, uh, that, you know, this is a large company. One of the, on, on any given day, it's, it's one of the three largest companies in the world, maybe the, you know, b- between Apple and Amazon and Microsoft. And, 
uh, and its its PE ratio is definitely high. It's it's 35. Its forward PE ratio is still above 30, but I, th I think it still has room to grow. It, it is amazing, Matt, how large that company is, and yet how well it has it has shifted gears and, and changed directions and added product lines, like you've mentioned, and then also maintained those enterprise relationships uh, as it's as it's transitioned in the cloud. I think it's done a fantastic job with that. You think that investors are still underestimating underestimating Microsoft? Uh, yeah, I, I think, well, I mean, like, uh, you know, like Austin might say, like that the company's like too large to, uh, to, to, to get, you know, it's too large. It, it can't grow too much. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think, you know, we're, we're going to have, there's going to be a first $2 trillion company. And, and in a few years, you're, there's going to be a first $5 trillion company. And I, I think Microsoft will, will be in the running. Like it, I mean, would it, would, it, would it really shock anyone if I said in 10 years, Microsoft's going to be a, a $5 trillion company? Uh, you know, it wouldn't shock me. Um, so, yeah, I just think the spaces are, that it's in with AI and, and big data and the cloud, like, I, I just think, like, it's, it's one of the few cloud inf infrastructure plays that still has lots of room to grow. Matt, quick, quick question. And this uh, Peru, our friend Peru actually kind of pointed this out in a tweet that point about Azure slowing down 59% um, year over year growth in Q120 down to 47% in Q2. And what Peru pointed out was that the CEO actually said that COVID-19 has turbocharged di digitalization, but then, you know, a quarter later we saw Azure grow slow. Is that concerning to you at all? Or what are your thoughts on that? Um, so this is what I would say, like, yeah, in the first quarter, they said, we're just seeing like incredible digital, digitization growth, right? Uh, but right now, there's a lot of economic uncertainty. And un until that passes, like, I, you're going to have some companies putting off large decisions, uh, you know, where that, that costs money, you know, until they have more clarity on on how their business is going to do. And that goes for small companies, but also goes for large companies. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, to me, like, you know, if a, if a little revenue growth was pulled forward, it, it was 59% in the first quarter and only, only quote unquote, only 47% this quarter. That, that, that's not too concerning for me. Yep, that's a good one, Matt. I'll, I'll bring us home here with uh, the company that is on my radar right now that I think is overvalued that a lot of people are missing the bigger picture on is Viva Systems. And the ticker on that is V-E-E-V, -E -E -V, funny name, but serious company. It's a cloud-based software company that's helping life sciences companies um, either either produce or sell their, their pharmaceutical drugs. And so it kind of started as a company that was helping them get through clinical trials. You know, a lot of that was just being done on paper submissions. It brought everything to the cloud, made everything much more efficient. Of course, that's where pharmaceutical companies have the majority of their costs is in developing drugs, getting them to commercialize. And once they do commercialize, they want to track those. They want to see how they're doing and how they're selling at different doctor's offices. And so they've got a Viva CRM product that went on to be called now Viva Commercial Cloud. Uh, this is just a company that has executed very well since day one. You hear about all these software companies, all of these, these cloud companies that are extremely unprofitable and burning through cash. Viva was basically profitable since it IPO'd in terms of operating profits. It's now got a 35% cash for operating cash flow margin that's growing at 46% per year. And when you think about how strong that is, in addition to the revenue growth, subscription revenue growth of 36% a year, this is a company that listens very well to its customers. It's providing a lot of value. It's continued to add on products to those large pharmaceutical company offerings that it already has. And it's just been rewarded with, with kind of solid top line growth and then very profitable um, cash from operations that it, come, that it brings in and just puts it right back into R&D. And this is one of those that along the entire way, people have said, no, it's too expensive. It was not a large enough addressable market. Uh, it wasn't growing fast enough to be a cloud-based company. All, all these things that Viva just kind of scoffed at and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to put our head down and we're going to focus on listening to our customers and provide them with solutions that are valuable. And it's been rewarded because the stock continues to go up and it's continuing to grow now too. One of its products that developed just a, several years ago, uh, Viva Vault, is now 50% of revenue. And so you can kind of see how something that was small that can be an R&D project from listening to its customers can grow into something much, much larger. So Viva Systems is my company that I still think has got plenty of opportunity, even as people have said it's overvalued uh, the whole way up. So, and Simon, okay, go, go ahead, built on, on Salesforce's platform, right? And I, I'm not super familiar with this, but 
I know they have a very deep partnership. Is that at all a, a risk for Viva in your eyes, or is it almost a strength because they're they're such great partners? They they're very strong, very 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 strong partners. It's a very much a, a benefit, not a risk, and that's because Viva Gasner. Uh, I'm sorry, Peter Gassner of Viva came from Salesforce. He was, you know, VP of, uh, of Salesforce before he started Viva. He made sure that he locked it down, made non-compete clauses with Salesforce. He designed much of the Salesforce CRM platform. And so they loved him there and they were really excited to work with him as a, his infrastructure provider for Viva. I think that's a huge opportunity. I don't think that's a risk actually. And they're, they're really kind of too specialized for a company like Salesforce or Microsoft to to like try to usurp, right? I mean, they're, they're in such a, like that specialized market that larger software companies like Salesforce or Microsoft, they're not, they're not gonna try to get into that. Healthcare is a, is a massive market that is underestimated, I think, by, by many people. There's just so much opportunity for personalized medicine right now. Uh, you hear a lot about CRISPR, you hear about CAR-T, you hear about all these kind of personalized therapies and even gene edited, um, opportunities. This is something that's going to require a lot more work. And I think that maybe, maybe that is true, Matt, that, you know, Salesforce doesn't have an interest in this, you know, anyways, but I, I think that in the grander scheme of things, the U S is spending $3 trillion a year on healthcare. A lot of that is through, um, prescription drugs. And I, I think this is going to be something that we're going to be talking about for at least the next decade, if not more than that cloud-based growth in life sciences. I was thinking more, not from competition, but more on, I think they've got to renew their agreement in 2025 or something. If, if Salesforce were to hike fees or something like that, or, you know, probably not going to happen, but if anything happened to Salesforce's platform, since, since um, Viva relies solely on Salesforce, you know, we see a lot of companies not want to build on a single cloud vendor, like only AWS or only Azure. So they use, you know, two or three of them. That was kind of what I was thinking about, about a potential risk to Viva, but. Um, yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean, it could also turn them into a potential acquisition candidate, you know, for yeah. Salesforce. Yeah, so yeah. If the market's big enough, they'd be like, well, this makes sense. You know, you rely on us. So why and not? We know that us? Salesforce likes to make acquisitions out there. So oh, that would yes, complement oh, yeah. nicely. Uh, so there's four companies for your radar. Again, you know, Austin mentioned Peloton, Steve mentioned 2U. Uh, I just mentioned Viva Systems and Matt mentioned Microsoft. Uh, again, just to close out our, our podcast here, earlier today, or earlier in the podcast, Steve was mentioning the American Customer Satisfaction Index, uh, which kind of measures how happy people are with different industries overall. And he mentioned breweries. Breweries was the highest rated industry in terms of customer satisfaction. To close out the podcast, would you gentlemen like to guess what the lowest ranked industry is for customer satisfaction? Cell phones. Cable companies. Ah, that's uh, a good one. Insurance. So number one was subscription television. Ah, just like oh, you wow. said. So and Austin, said, uh, yeah. to the phone one, internet service providers was the second worst too. So you nailed them. Uh, the companies with low customer service scores, obviously people don't like staying on hold, waiting for your, your cable TV or your, your internet to come back online almost kind of the opposite of so many of the companies we talked about that have really high customer satisfaction scores here today. Uh, hey, Steve Symington, hey, Austin Lieberman. This, and how, how, this is coming out on Thursday. Don't we have some, some recommendations coming out soon? We do. We're going to have our new recommendations come out on Saturday, August the 1st. Uh, which, like you just said, Austin, conveniently two days after this podcast. So come check out 7investing.com to see our latest picks. And if you don't get in before the first, it's not too late. These are designed to be picks for, you know, multiple, multiple years. So, so come check us out. Absolutely. Thank you for the reminder on that one. Again, Steve Symington, Austin Lieberman, and Matt Cochran. Uh, and my name is Simon Erickson. Again, we are your team here at 7investing. You can check out our site, 7investing.com. Our mission is to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7investing.